This is a lecture on expo log 2 and expo log 3. Now in expo log 2, let's review some algebra 2 concepts that you learned last year. For example, compounded interest. Well, before we even do that, I think we should discuss this number E. Where, where did this number E come from? Now, some of you probably just memorized something like, oh, E is approximately 2.718. Maybe your Algebra 2 teacher told you just memorize the darn thing. Yeah, but it's important to know where it came from. E is actually the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power. In other words, if you plug in bigger and bigger numbers for n into this expression right here, you're going to get closer and closer to this number. And this number we call E, named after the mathematician Euler. And in this class, 2.718 is not good enough. We, we need to know 15 decimal places. This is going to be on the test, by the way. 2.718281828456 these are 15 decimal places of E. And this is the way we memorize it. First, you have to memorize the 2. If you don't know it's 2 point something, then just go home cook rice already. And then, now you just have to know some history. The seventh president of the United States is Andrew Jackson. He served two consecutive terms beginning in 1828. See, 1828, 1828. And his favorite triangle, the 4590-45 triangle. That's how you memorize 15 decimal places of E. And actually, this is actually a special case of a more general formula, which is this. E, is equal, e to the x is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus x over n to the nth power. And this is, another, this is also going to come up on the homework and the quiz and the test. So, let me give you an example. What if I give you this problem? What is the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 2 over n to the nth power? What would happen if you plug in bigger and bigger numbers for n, like a million, a billion, a trillion? These numbers are going to get closer to what number? Well, the answer is e to the 2. See, whatever number is up here, that's the power of e. Just like over here, since that's a 1, and it's going to be e to the 1, but this one is 2, so that's why it's e to the 2. But do you really think the problems are going to be this easy in honors? Don't be ridiculous. They're going to look something like this, maybe. What is the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 minus uh, 3 to the n to the 2n power? So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to turn this expression right here into something that looks like this so we can apply this, this formula here. So limit n approaches infinity. Now first thing you notice though, there's a plus sign there. So how can I change that to a plus sign? Well, I'll put the negative with the 3 there. And then the power needs to be just n. Over there, there's 2n. So what do you do? You low me, low me, you massage it like this. You put the n there, but that, that's 2n. So what you do is you put the 2 on the outside of the brackets like that because you would multiply the exponents to get the 2n there. Now look at the thing in the brackets. Look, 1 plus box over n to the nth power, right here. 1 plus x over n to the nth power is e to the x. So if you take the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus box over n to the nth power, what is that going to get closer to? e to the box, but the box in this case is negative 3. So this gets closer to e to the negative 3. But then the whole thing, therefore, is going to get closer to e to the negative 3 squared, which is e to the negative 6. So if you see something like this, what you got to do is you got to low me, low me, you got to massage it until it looks like that. Well, you guys think you're good now, yeah? Well, let's do another one then. What is the limit as n approaches infinity of n over n plus 1 to the nth power? Now this one you're going to see a lot in BC calculus, so we, we need to know how to do it. So how can I make this 
look like this? Mr. Park, I can't even do anything. Yeah, you can. So sometimes what you need to do is you need to hooli it first. You've got to flip it over. Hooli. So like this. N plus 1 over N. Can you just do that? Yeah, if you put the negative in the exponent, right? Because negative 1 means reciprocatize. And then now we use a technique what's known as lift and separate. So remember in Algebra 1, you guys learned this? A plus B over C is equal to A over C plus B over C, right? So let's do the same thing to this. So lift and separate, lift and separate. N over N is 1, and 1 over N is 1 over N. And again, we need just nth power there. So you put the nth power there, and you low me it by putting the negative 1 out there. Because when you multiply the exponents, you get negative n. See, and the thing in the brackets, a, you somebody. 1 plus 1 over n to the nth power, and if you take the limit as n approaches infinity, that's going to get closer to e to the 1, which is e. So the thing in the brackets gets closer and closer to e, therefore the whole thing gets closer and closer to e to the negative 1. And here's a little tidbit as well. e to the negative 1, 1 over e, is approximately 0.367. This is, this is kind of a number you might want to know, as you, maybe for, for graphing purposes or something. But there are certain numbers in math that you should know. That's one of them. Okay, now that we know what the number e is, I think we know the number e. Let's do some review of Algebra 2. Now, your compounding interest formulas is A equal P 1 plus R over N to the NT power. Bring you back memories? Yeah? This is compounding interest when you compound interest N times a year. So, not N times a year. Yeah, N times a year. So, for example, what if I say I'm going to invest uh, $10,000 into a account pay, paying an annual rate of uh, about 6.4%, that's kind of good, and interest is going to be compounded quarterly. How much money will be in the account after, say, five years? Well, you simply plug it into the formula. Okay, so you got A, that's the amount that you're going to get, is equal to the principal, which is $10,000, how much money you started with, 1 plus R. Now, if the rate is 6.4%, you put 0 0.064. And interest is compounded quarterly, so that's 4 times a year, so 4 to the 4T power. But we're going to do it for 5 years, so putting in 5 years for T, we get that. Punch it in on your calculator, boom, that's the answer. But this is the formula that you need to use. And I know you guys learned this last year. Now, what if interest is compounded like 12 times a year, monthly, or every day, or every second? Yes, you're going to make more money, but there's a limiting amount. And of course, that limiting amount depends on E, because what happens right here? You see this formula here? Well, what, here, let's write it again. P times 1 plus R over N to the NT power. What would happen if I take the limit as n approaches infinity? In other words, the number of times you compound interest a year goes to infinity. What happens to this formula? Well, look at this. What if we put the brackets like that? Right? Because when it's outside the parentheses, you're going to multiply the exponents anyway. And then what do you know? 1 plus box over n to the nth power. If you take the limit as n approaches infinity, that goes to e to the box. So if the thing in the brackets gets closer and closer to e to the r, then the whole thing will get closer to p, e to the r t power n. Hey, we learned it last year. That's the compounding interest formula, except interest is compounded what we call continuously. That means the number of times we compound interest is approaching infinity. So if you're going to compound interest continuously, so let's cross out this quarterly, and let's put the word continuously there, then we use this formula. So the amount of money you would have after five years would be 10,000 e to the r, which is 0 0.064, to the, uh, times t to the 5. 
punch that in on your calculator, that's how much money you're going to have after five years if interest is compounded continuously. And you're going to find that the amount of, of this is not that much more than this. Well, you need to do it on your calculator. That's going to be number one on your homework. Now, number two on your homework tonight, you have to draw some important graphs. Um, before, I used to have them do it by hand, but if, you know what, since I'm not here, why don't you guys just use your calculator? But I'm going to show you one of them. The first, this is the first one, 2A graph. Y equal the hyperbolic cosine function. Say what, girlfriend? Well, by definition, the hyperbolic co cosine function is e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. Well, I guess before we can even do this, we have to know what the base graph of e to the x looks like. So why don't we draw that first? So y equal e to the x. Now, last year, I think when you guys graphed exponential functions, your teacher expected you to graph maybe five points. Okay. And you know what we can do? We can start off by graphing three, but when you draw the base graph, I want you to graph one point. Okay, so let's plot some key points. Plug in zero. E to the zero, of course, is one. Plug in one. E to the one, well, 2.7182818284590045. But I'll accept 2.7 2 good enough for graphing purposes, 2.7. And then what about negative one? E to the negative one, remember I told you, 0.367? Well, that would be something like this. And then a, you know, a typical exponential function when the base is greater than one will look something like this. See how the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote? But when we draw these graphs, you know, pretty much when this is greater than one, it, it has the shape. So, when we graph the base graph, I don't, I don't need you to graph all these points. That's algebra 2. Now we're in pre-cal and we're going to calculus. This is what I want. You plot the point 0, 1 and you just go, hee -haw. That's what I want. All right, so to graph the hyperbolic cosine function, this is what you do. Do you know how to graph this? Yeah, I just showed you. Na, 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 na. Do I know how to graph this? Yeah, if you plug in negative x for x, it reflects it over the y-axis, so it looks like this. Na, 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 And then, what happens when you add two things and divide by two? You're finding the average. So, can you find the average of these two graphs that we just drew? Yeah, like, for example, both y-coordinates here are one. What's the average of one and one? One. Now, Mr. Park, how am I going to find the average of this y-coordinate and that y-coordinate? Well, what we can do is we can draw these vertical bars in like this. And of course, when you find the average of this and this, you're just going to go halfway in between. So you just have to find the midpoint of each of these segments like this. Connect the dots. So there you go. That's what the hyperbolic cosine function looks like. And this is a very important graph in physics because if you were to hang a chain or a rope under the influence of gravity like that, you know what the shape of that would be? The hyperbolic cosine function. We call this a catenary. In fact, you can impress your physics teacher if you know that. Anyway, so this year, those four graphs, just draw it on your calculator. You're going to see these in calculus and statistics. Very important. Okay, and number four, you're going to have to draw graphs. What? You're right. There's a lot of graphing to be done here. So, oh my goodness, the glare is bad here. Hopefully you can see this on the thing. That's because right now we're, it's only 6.50 in the morning. Okay, so here's the base graph. Uh, e to the x. Let's draw that. And if you want to think of these points, this is one, negative 1, e to the negative 1, and 1, E cat. Now, what if I were to ask you, graph the inverse of this? How do you graph the inverse? Well, you switch all the x and y coordinates. So this is 0, 1. If you switch it, you get 1, 0. Here is the point negative 1, 1 over e. So what, and remember, 1 over e is like 0 0.367. So what happens when you switch? You get 0 0.367, negative 1. And then here is the point 1, e, or 1, 2.7. What happens when you switch it? You get 2.71. Connect the dots. That's the inverse. And again, anytime you graph a function and it's inverse, it's going to be symmetric about the line y equal x. And it is. 
Okay, but here's the thing. What is the equation of this graph? Well, if you, how do you find the inverse of anything? You switch the x's and y's and solve for y. So you switch the x's and y's here, you get x equal e to the y. Now, how do you solve for y? Well, you can't do it algebraically, so last year we learned logarithms, right? So, if to solve for y, okay, let's just review some algebra 2 here. If you have log base b of a is equal to c, that means the same thing as b to the c equals a. And remember, your teacher told you if you can switch back and forth between these two forms, right? Exponential form and logarithmic form, you'll be good in this chapter, right? Same thing. So, this is exponential form, like this. Change it to log form. Isn't this the same thing as y equals log base e of x? See? e to the y equals x, which is that thing up there. So, you're just changing it to log form. Yes, it is. And then, what did we learn last year? When you have log base e, that we don't say log base e, we say natural log x. So natural log x means the same thing as log base e of x. Just like, what did you learn last year? If you have a log and there's no base written here, what is it? Base 10, and we call that a common logarithm. This is natural logarithm. Now when you go to calculus next year, everything is gonna be natural logarithm. So you just, in this class, when we do this, we're gonna do all natural logarithms. We're not gonna do it, use any other logs. Okay, so what, we, what you're going to have to do on your homework tonight is you're going to have to draw graphs. So I'll, I'll do one example from each one. So you're going to have to take the base graph, and then you're going to have to do stuff to it, just like you did a couple chapters ago, right? So what if I give you something like this? Uh, y equal e to the negative x, how about the uh, uh, 1 minus, and then absolute value that. Wow, the glare is bad for me. Nah, I think for you guys it's okay. Okay, so here, what's the base graph? E to the x. So here's the point zero, 01. Da, 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 da. Now what does that do to the graph? It reflects it over the y-axis. And then, what does this do? Multiplying the function by negative 1 reflects it over the x-axis. So now the graph looks like this. And then what does this plus one do? It shifts the graph one up. So everything moves one up. So this point goes up here. This asymptote is now here. Yes, you need to draw an asymptote with a dotted line. So now the graph looks like this. Na, 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 na. And then finally, absolute value around the whole thing means everything below the x-axis gets reflected above. So if it's positive, you leave it alone. If it's negative, you negate it. So it looks like this. Ah! And there, that's, that's what I expect of you. Okay, let's do a natural log graph here. How about y equal natural log x plus 1. And then what the heck? Let's put the absolute value in the whole thing. I might be doing two of your homework problems. First step, draw the base graph. So here's the point, 1, 0. Okay, what does this do to the graph? It shifts it one to the left. So this point comes here, and then this asymptote is here. See, because look, the graph of e to the x, see how the x-axis is an asymptote? So when you find the inverse, then the y-axis is going to be a, an asymptote, right? Because you're switching the x's and the y's. So now the graph looks like this. And then again, absolute value of the whole thing means everything above stays the same. And then everything below the x-axis gets reflected above. And there you go. That's what the graph of natural log x plus 1 absolute value looks like. Okay, so you got to draw, looks like, uh, what, six graphs of tonight's homework? Now, here's another thing. What inst if instead of e to the x, what if we just had b to the x power, where b is any base, and why don't we just say it's greater than 1? But it could also be like between 0 and 1, but in order for the graph to look like that, b has to be greater than 1. Now, what would happen with the inverse? Then this would be x equals b to the y, and then you get log base b of x, right? Now, what, what, the, what, what is the relationship between this graph and this graph? Well, they're inverses of each other. 
And what do we know? If two functions are inverses of each other, what happens when you plug one into the other? And it really doesn't matter what order you do it in. We learned this in functions, the function chapter. If two functions are inverses of each other, you plug one into the other, you will always get x. So, since the exponential and the logarithmic function are inverses of each other, if you plug one into the other, so if I take this and plug it in there, b to the log base b of x, you will get x. And if I took this and plug it in here, log base b of b to the x, you will get x. And these come from the fact that these functions are inverses of each other. So for example, what is log base 5 of 5 to the third? It's 3. Why? Because they're inverses of each other. What is uh, 7 to the log base 7 of 4? The answer is 4 from this. And the, why? Because they're inverses of each other. Okay, so you're going to get several of those. And then you're going to have... Uh, okay, why don't we... Do, I'm going to do a problem like number 8. Okay, let's get rid of this. So... Number 8 looks something like this. f of x is equal to natural log, and we don't want to make it too, how about something like this? x minus 1 over x plus 2. Okay, first part, find the domain. Now, whenever you have a logarithm, this thing, which is called the argument, must be positive. Because, I mean, look at the graph of, 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 of a log graph. What is the domain of this? Well, isn't it x is greater than 0? So if you have natural log box, the box got to be greater than 0. So whenever you have a logarithm, the argument must be greater than 0. You solve that inequality, that will give you the domain. Now, do we know how to solve inequalities? We should. Make one side 0, factor this side, which it is, and you make a number line. Negative 2, 1. No, no. Plus, minus, plus, and we want greater than 0, so we shaded the plus signs. So there's the number line of your domain. So your domain would look like this, negative infinity to negative 2, and then 1 to infinity and beyond. Okay, and then part B says find the inverse. Now, how do you find the inverse of this? Well, think of this as y. You switch the x's and y's. So x equals natural log y minus 1 over y plus 2. Okay, now, now what do I do? Well, your teacher last year told you to change it to exponential form, right? What's the base here that's not written? E. So isn't this the same thing as e to the x equals this? So e to the x is equal to this. And that's perfectly fine, but I'm going to show you another way of thinking about it, which, which yields the same result. Now remember, you can do the same thing to both sides of an equation. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to e both sides. See, if gorilla equals banana, then e to the gorilla equals e to the banana. Now, why do I do that? Well, e to the x is e to the x. And what is e to the natural log armadillo? Armadillo! See, right here. Since these functions are inverses of each other, so, we, so e to the natural log gorilla is gorilla. Right? Because that's the base e there. That's this one right here. They're inverses of each other. So you plug one into the other, you're going to get x. So e to the natural log gorilla is gorilla. And then now it's easy to find the in, um, solve, solve for y. All you have to do is cross multiply y e to the x plus 2 e to the x equal y minus 1. Put all the y's on one side. y e to the x minus y is equal to negative 2 e to the x minus 1. Factor out the y, e to the x minus 1. This is just algebra. Algebra never hurt anyone. y equal negative 2 e to the x minus 1 over e to the x minus 1. And boom, there's your inverse. So, Yes, you can do what you did last year. If you have this, change it from log form to exponential form, but I kind of like this. If you want to get rid of an ln, you e both sides. What happens when you want to get rid of an e? Well, let's take a look at that one. What if you had y equals 3e to the 2x plus 1?
How would you find the inverse of that? Well, you switch the x's and y's. Okay, then divide by 3, because you want to isolate this term here, the e. And then, now, if you want to, you can do what you did last year, change it to log form, which you would do this like this, yeah? Log base e of x over 3 is equal to 2y plus 1, right? And then, of course, log base e is natural log x over 3 is equal to 2y plus 1. And you can solve for y, that's not difficult. But here's another way to think about it. So if you want to get rid of a natural log, you e it. If you want to get rid of an e, you natural log it. Because the natural log of e to the gorilla is gorilla, because they're inverses of each other. Okay, so right here, I'm going to natural log both sides. Natural log x over 3 is natural log e to the 2y plus 1. But what is the natural log of e to the anaconda? Anaconda. See, you get the same thing. It's a different way of thinking about it. And then now, is it easy to solve for y? You bet your bippy it is. You subtract 1 first and then divide by 2. So natural log x over 3 minus 1 all over 2. And if you want to do this, to be clear, you can do that. But, you know, once you see this, you, you already know that this is one, one term right there like that. Okay, so that takes you through expo log 2. Now, expo log 3, you have to know your properties of exponents. Now, every year, students seem to remember this one very well. Now, since we're on, primarily only going to be working with natural logs, I'm going to do, um, I'm just going to show you the natural log version of it. Okay? So, no, you know what? You guys are growing up. Let, let's look at the regular one. So log base b of m times n is equal to log base b of m plus log base b of n. Does that sound familiar? It should. Log base b of m over n is equal to log base b of m minus log base b of n. And then log base b of m to the nth power is equal to n log base b of m. So whenever you have a power here, you can just put it in the front. So these are your three basic properties of logarithms. And then the change of base formula. Log base b of a. So suppose you have a logarithm and you don't like this base and you want to change it to a different base. Well, you use the change of base formula log base c of a over log base c of b. Easy to remember because look, the top number goes on the top, the bottom number goes on the bottom. And you can change it to any other logarithm you want. Most of the time though, we're going to be changing it to natural log. So this would be the same thing as natural log a over natural log b. So that's what you got to know for this chapter. Now in this chapter, you're going to be solving equations. Okay, let's, let's take a look at one. Uh, how about, let me make up one here, log base uh, 4 of x uh, plus log base 4 of x plus 1 minus log base 4 of x plus 2, no, minus 2 is equal to negative 3 halves. How about something like that? So what you want to do is you want to combine this into one logarithm using your properties of logarithm. So isn't this the same thing as log base 4 of x times x plus 1, since these are added together, over x minus 2, because that's a minus, right? So we're combining these two properties together. And then that's equal to negative 3 halves. See, the reason why you want just one logarithm is now you can either change it to exponential form, right? 4 to this equals that. Or, what did I just teach you? You 4 both sides, right? So if I 4 both sides, 4 to the log base 4 of eel is eel. And what is 4 to the negative 3 halves? Come on, man. For, well... How do you compute 4 to the 3 halves? Now, there's two ways of doing it. You can go 4 cubed to the 1 half, or you could go 4 to the 1 half cubed, right? Because you're going to multiply the exponents. 
But which one is better? Now, some of you are thinking, well, either one is fine. Yes, but what happens when this number is like really bigger? For example, what if I ask you to find 16 to the 5 fourths power? Do you really want to go 16 to the 5th and then 1 fourth? How many people know 16 to the 5th? Not me. No, I actually know it, but whatever. No, it's better to 1 fourth power at first and then raise it to the 5th because 1 fourth power means fourth root, the fourth root of 16, 2. 2 to the 5th, 32. So it's better to do the fractional part first, make the number smaller, and then, then raise it to the power, just like here. 4 to the 1 half is square root of 4, 2, 2 cubed is 8. And then negative exponent means 1 over, so this is 1 over 8. And now you simply got an algebra 1 equation. So how would you solve something like this? Uh, cross multiply. So you got 8. Can we do this all at once, or do we have to go x squared plus x? 8x squared plus, do whatever you have to to get it right. Hey, it's a quadratic equation. Make one side 0. 8x squared plus 7x plus 2 is equal to 0. So does this fact, doesn't look like it's factorable, so we need to use quadratic formula. No, this is factorable. Let's see. At first, at first glance, it didn't look factorable, but I, now I think it is factorable. So what is this? 4x, 2x. Maybe it's not factorable. 8x, 1x. Yeah, I don't think it's factorable. Hey, wait a minute. We get no solution. This is a bad problem, man. Because using the quadratic formula, you're not going to get a real number solution. x equal negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. See how the discriminant is negative? So there's no real solution for this problem. Ah, this is a bad problem. Well, anyway, that's how you would do it. And then once you get your answer, you got to make sure that each of these arguments are positive because that's the domain of a logarithm, right? So you always got to check. Too bad. Okay, what are some other, oh, half-life problems. Oh, uh, let's do two more, well, two more examples, and I think that'll cover it all, because this should be all reviewed. So another problem you're going to see is, will be something like this. Natural log, what if I said natural log 2 is equal to A, natural log 3 is equal to B, and natural log 5 is equal to C. Write the natural log of, uh, um, um, uh, 14.4. I hope I'm doing this correctly in my head. Write the natural log of 14.4 in terms of A and B. Well, let's see if this even works out. Hopefully I did the calculations in my head correctly. Well, the first thing you want to do is change 14.4 into a fraction. So what is that? 14 and don't say 4 tenths, 2 fifths. Yeah, I think I did it right. Natural log, change that to an improper fraction. 70, so 72 over 5. Did I do that correctly? Of course, I'm the teacher. Now, use your properties of logarithms so that you can use these things here. Well, isn't the natural log of 72 over 5 the same thing as natural log 72 minus natural log 5? Yeah, so see, that's C already. All we're going to do now is break down the 72. Now, how am I going to break down the 72? Well, isn't 72 the same thing as 8 times 9? Now, why did you pick 8 times 9? Why didn't you go like uh, uh, the, the 3 times 24 or something like that? Yeah, you, you could have. But the reason why I picked 8 and 9 is because 8 is 2 to the 3rd power and 9 is 3 to the 2nd power. See how you want to write it as powers? Because one of the properties is you can put the powers in the front. So, since these are multiplied together, this is natural law of gorilla plus natural log banana minus natural log anaconda. And then when you have a power, you can put the power in the front. Same thing here. And then we got it. So your answer is 3a plus 2b minus c. Katush. See, this problem is good to help you practice your properties of logarithms. Okay, last example. 
half-lives or some exponential growth problem. So let's say the half-life half-life of a radioactive substance is, uh, make up something, five hours. So in other words, it takes five hours for a given amount to decay to half of that. Now, we should be able to write an exponential function from, for this, right? SAT, PSAT, ACT, you've got to be able to do it. So Y equal Y naught. Remember, Y naught is the initial amount that you have. And since we're talking about a half-life, that's a one-half. And if it takes five hours for the, the amount to decay to one-half, then what do I put here? T over five. Okay, so if the half-life of uh, radioactive substance is five hours, I write, I write this exponential function here. And then the question will be, how many hours will it take for uh, a given amount to decay to 10% of the original amount? That sounds too wordy, but come on, I had a 400 SAT verbal. Get off my back! So how many hours will it take for a given amount to decay to 10% of the original amount? Well, this is your original amount. What is 10% of that? One-tenth, why not? And where do I plug that in? You plug it in right here. So you get one-tenth, why not? is equal to y naught. See, so you really don't even need to know the initial amount. One half to the t over five power. The y naughts cancel out, and look, the only variable you have left is t, and that's what we want. How many hours will it take for a given amount to decay to one-tenth of the given amount? Well, now how do you solve an equation with the variables in the exponent? That's when you're gonna use logarithms, okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to natural log both sides. Now why are we doing that? Because when you have a logarithm, now you don't have to natural log both sides, but get into the habit of doing that because that's what you're going to do in calculus next year. That's because whenever you have a logarithm, you can put the power in the front. And once you put the power in the front, this is just the simple algebra 1 equation. Okay, easy to solve for t now, right? t is equal to, multiply the 5 on this side, 5 natural log 1 10 over natural log 1 half. Now this is, this is a good enough answer. You can plug this in on your calculator if you want to get a decimal value. But then if you, you're going to, see this is a lesson that you should learn right here. This is correct, but you might look at the answer in the back or if you're taking the AP exam, this is not going to be one of the choices. You have to be able to simplify this. So this is the same thing as 5 natural log 10 over natural log 2. What? Well, isn't 1 tenth the same thing as 10 to the negative 1 power? And 1 half is 2 to the negative 1 power. And when you have a logarithm, you can put the power in the front, put this power in the front, the negatives cancel out, and boom, that's how you got that. Or another way of thinking about it is, isn't natural log 1 tenth, tenth the same thing as natural log 1 minus natural log 10? And natural log 1 half is the same thing as natural log 1 minus natural log 2. But what is natural log 1? e to the what power equals 1? 0. So this is 0, this is 0. These negative signs cancel out, and you still get 5 natural log 10 over natural log 2. And th this is kind of the way to do it on the AP exam to test to see if you know your properties of logarithms. You can do all the work, and you're going to get this as your answer, but you're going to look at the four choices, and that's not one of them. So you're going to have to use your properties of logarithms to change it. All right. Good enough.